I think it's the top of the hour, and so we should begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host today, and I'm really delighted to host all of you. We have a terrific guest today talking about a great subject. I'm looking forward to our conversation. We've been here at the forum talking about teaching and learning in institutions since our very first session way back in 2016. And we've been examining teaching and learning ever since from multiple different directions, everything from curriculum and pedagogy to how to change curriculum, how to change pedagogy. And there's one topic that has come up repeatedly, but we've never really addressed wholeheartedly, which is the importance of teaching and learning centers. And I think ever since, especially the pandemic, I think teaching and learning centers have really come into their own. Uh, they're growing in number, they're growing influence and importance. And I think it's well past time that we devote an entire session to exploring them and how they'll be changing the future of higher education. And I can't think of a better guest to do this with than Mary Wright. Not only did she and I go to the same university for grad school in the 1990s, which is pretty amazing, but she's the author of a really new book called The Centers for Teaching and Learning from Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, if you uh, look in the very bottom of your screen, the left corner, you'll see a link to it. Uh, and this is a great guide to what that whole immersion field looks like. So without any further ado, and without me continuing to talk so much, let me just welcome uh, Professor and Director Mary Wright. And good afternoon. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's so good to see you. It's so good to see you there. Uh, and you're coming to us from Brown University, right? That's right. I am on the seventh floor of the Sciences Library in Providence, Rhode Island. Oh, see, if, if, if you, know, you should really just tilt the camera to give us a glimpse of beautiful Providence. Um, I don't think you'll get a glimpse of beautiful Providence from my window. I think oh. you'll get a glimpse of a, a window. I see. So a kind of uh, a, a, a very spirit. reflective situation. Uh, well, it's it's so I'm so glad you could join us. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. But l let me ask you the first question. And this is the question we ask every guest, which is what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the major projects and what are the major ideas that are top of mind for you looking ahead into 2025? So what does my near future hold? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'll mention three projects. Uh, the first one is I'm excited that I have a book coming out with collaborators from Colby College and University of Virginia, and that will be coming out from Rutledge in 2025 on high impact course design institutes. Hmm. Now, that may sound like a very specific topic, yeah, but yeah. Uh, there's a lot of re robust research uh, around the effectiveness of course design institutes as we might talk about today, they, they scale up the work from the individual to the level of a unit of analysis of a course. So they're quite interesting in that way. And I found in my book, there weren't a lot of centers doing them, only hmm. about 15%. So we're hoping that this book will help spread this interesting model of doing educational development. How, how many of these centers are there? How many centers are there? Yeah. Um, so there's 1,209 centers that I found in my book. Hmm. And that that research took place over 2019, uh, 2019 and 2020. Um, the second uh, project that I'm also excited about is, so in 2006, there was a landmark book that probably many people in the room are familiar with called Creating the Future of Faculty Development. That was the first large scale survey of, at that time, we called it faculty development. That survey was replicated in 2016 in a book called Faculty Development in the Age of Evidence. Mm. And I think this thread is too important to let drop. We need to understand the history of our field and how it evolves. And so I'm working with Tracy Addy, who founded the Center for Teaching and Learning at Lafayette College and is now founding another center at Rutgers. And with Brett Einan, who's at Achieving the Dream, which yeah. is on campus. Yeah colleges and associates institutions. Sure. And then Jackie Rivard, who is an author of the, that book, and she's now at University of Southern Mississippi. So, so we have a really large scale survey. We're analyzing the data and writing that up now. So that's another piece coming down the road. Excellent. And then the third piece that I want to highlight is those pieces that that work has been uh, US focused, a US study of educational development and educational developers. I anticipate over the next year, my, my work taking a significant international turn and focusing on what the rest of the world might call academic development. Mm. And so this is 
taking a couple of shapes. One is that I co-edit a journal called the International Journal of Academic Development, or IJAD. And that's the journal of the International Consortium of Educational Development, a group that brings together professional associations around the world, like the Pod Network. And I'm working with a, a team from New Zealand, the US, Sweden, Slovakia, and we'll have a special issue coming out about trust. And that's mm. such a huge issue in higher ed these days. So I think mm. that's going to be quite impactful. I'm also beginning some projects with Esther Common uh, at the University of Sydney and Lindsay Wheeler at UVA on informal pedagogical leadership. And then with Matthew Good, who works with me at Brown and Jessica Frawley, also at University of Sydney, to do some comparative work from an institutional lens on thinking about students as partners. Mm. Oh, excellent. You, you, you are just a one person fleet doing all of this different work. That's incredible. Um, will you be teaching as well? Uh, we will see how that evolves. Mm, mm, I understand. I understand. Oh, well, this is terrific. I, I, it's so much impressive work. And, and by the way, in the past, you were the president of POD for several years, right? I served as president from 2017 to 2018 and then was on the executive team in the sandwich years. Around. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Well, there's so much impressive work. I'm really looking forward to learning more about it. In fact, maybe uh, in a year, depending on, on your timeline, you should come back and, uh, and join us just so uh, you know, we could catch up with what you're discovering. Thanks um, for the advanced invitation. I, I think it's important for the field. It's, it's taking a turn from craft to scholarship. And so I think it's really important to be part of the conversation around that scholarly work. Mm. And in your case, uh, helping found it. Um, friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our guest a couple of basic questions to get the ball rolling. But then I'm going to go turn the ball over to you, all of you. So whatever questions you would like to ask our guest, um, that's really the focus of the forum. So please uh, think about uh, what uh, what we talk about over the next few minutes, but also think about what you if you had a chance to read this book or if you're just looking at it for the first time, or if you work in a teaching and learning center or if you work near a teaching and learning center, such as you're a faculty member working with them or an administrator helping um, guide them. Uh, think about the questions that you'd like to put forward. And again, uh, the, uh, the Q&A box and the raised hand box are, are ready for you. I guess, Mary, one question that I that keeps coming to mind when I think of teaching and learning centers is, is how are they changing in the in the medium term? I mean, what's what are some of the uh, of the dynamics that are at play that are making them evolve over the next mm -hmm. one to three years? I think that's a great question because certainly they are evolving, and ha you mentioned COVID, and I think people typically mm -hmm. mark that as a pivot, but mm -hmm. actually, when I show in my book, it, these changes started well before COVID. Um, and so one that I'll pinpoint is that centers for teaching and learning are really focusing in on the active sense of that word center. They are centering. They are centering mm -hmm. different mandates or remits that typically or traditionally have been located elsewhere in the academy. And so these are things like instructional technology and mm -hmm. online learning, assessment, writing, service learning, community engagement, and career and leadership development. And Generally, I think that's a, a, a good thing. I, I think it's good to be centering teaching and learning in that way. Um, I think the challenge can be sometimes that centering is not done with intention and centers mm -hmm. can become a clown car of different projects that people can't find a home for. So I, I, I note in the book some cautions for senior leaders to be intentional and mindful of all that you want to center in your center for teaching and learning. I think an accompanying challenge is that that suggests we're doing more. But when I look at staffing ratios, um, there's a decrease in staffing ratios at centers compared to some prior work done by Jennifer Herman, who is an educational developer at Simmons University in Boston. Yeah. Um, I mean, you say staffing ratios. Do you mean the ratio of, of staff in a center to the ratio of full-time faculty on campus? Yes, yeah, center, center staff to the ratio of FTEs for faculty and also students as well, but I think faculty is probably the critical indicator there. And so that's a concerning juxtaposition that you're doing more, but doing more with less. Yes. Um, I mentioned the survey that we were doing of educational developers. We, from that perception, we see that those resource and staffing challenges feel particularly acute at community colleges, associates, colleges, 
And that's mm. concerning because that's an important sector of higher education. Yeah, a huge one too. So I would say centers though are adapting in, in I think interesting ways. They're feeling these challenges, but they're being resilient about it. One of the trends that I talk about a little in the book, I, I didn't unpack it a lot and I'm hoping someone else might do that. Mm -hmm. So throwing that out there to a researcher in the group is um, what I call the meta center or, or consortia approaches. So this mm. might, these might be centers sharing programs, sharing resources, using a networked approach. And so I think that's a, 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 an intriguing and research, resource efficient way to do the work. Are, are there any of those that we can see in the world currently existing? Sure. Um, there's the Great Lakes Colleges Association. I think Stephen Volk can tell more about that when we get to audience participation. Yeah. Um, I think in, in California, many of the state systems are networked in that way. Um, and so I footnote many other examples in the book, but those are two that come to mind. Oh, very good. Very good. GLCA and uh, yep. I mean, um, and looking at the California State University system, I know they have a lot of collaboration up and down that state. Yep. I think there's also a rise in tactics, too, that approach the work more at scale. So traditionally, the work had been very relational and one on one, Brian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, that is still important and still goes on. But I think we're moving to different scales of impact, like the rise of assessment and curriculum development. Mm -hmm. I can mention course design institutes as a different scale. Yeah. Open classroom weeks is an interesting way to do peer review at scale. And mm. so I think uh, centers are responding with different types of what I call tactics or programs and services. Um, the, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to mention one other thing, but follow up, Brian. No, 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 please, please. Um, so I think that's really encouraging. Um, but the, the caution and advice I have for centers, such as my own, is in, in light of that resource, resource, resource strain, we, we need to be cognizant that we can't do it all. Mm. And so what I do in the book, and I've invited some of these directors here today, is I, I admire centers that have a really clear sense of purpose, what I call a, a theory of change or a strategy. Mm -hmm. and, and then when their theory of change lines up then with the programs and services that they offer, I think that is where our work can be more impactful. And that's where we need to be moving over the next decade. Oh, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Uh, this, that's a good theory to uh, to have to test out and, and put in place. In the in the chat, the chat box is, is running at top speed. And in response to your um, Meta Center um, recommendation, we've had shout outs to different consortia, including the Associate College of the South, the Appalachian College Association, uh, the, one, the University of California CTL Consortium. And uh, Chelsea Chandler mentions that uh, in the Mid-American Conference, they create an informal network. They meet once a month and have a gathering of all at the end of the academic year, which is very exciting. I guess my, my second question is, and, and then I'll, I promise everyone I'll get out of the way, is um, how, how do we scale up this work? I mean, the, uh, some of the teaching and learning centers I've seen, uh, I don't have nearly your, your grasp on, on, on the subject, but I've seen a ratio I would estimate of, you know, say one to 100. Uh, you know, how do you, how does that one hardworking person, you know, manage to develop and help and assist and expand the teaching of so many dozens, if not hundreds of faculty? I mean, how do we scale this up beyond the one-to-one -one conversational relationship? Mode? Yeah, it's a great question because it was interesting to me to see um, the pod network has a small colleges committee, but it, it is also the case that um, a, a majority of our centers are small themselves. We are really a group of small centers. My, my center, where we have almost 50 FTEs, is quite the exception. Um, so about a quarter of centers in my book were sent what we call centers of one, one person, and another quarter were two to three people. Mm -hmm. so, so clearly with that resource limitation, one has to be quite mindful uh, of how can, one can address sort of the intellectual dodgeball of all the requests coming and think carefully again about theory of change and how programs and services line up with them. I think another thing that's important to do is thinking about, I think about this as a director, when, when do you pull the goalie? And I don't know if you're a hockey fan, Brian. I'm not, I'm not. So I don't know what you just said. Yeah, so, so this is a, a sports maneuver where you would take the hockey out of the goal and make them an offensive player to try and score a goal. Oh. 
So it's it's a really putting all of your eggs in one basket, to use another metaphor. That I understood. Yes. So during COVID, it was quite clear we needed to pull the goalie or put our eggs in the basket towards supporting academic continuity. All of our resources mm. had to go there. Mm. Mm. With every single other crisis coming our way, where generative AI, there may be environmental uh, concerns coming your way. Certainly, mm. there's issues around encampments at many campuses, civil dialogue. I think you need to make a strategic decision about how much you employ to address that, even if it comes to your plate seeming quite urgent. So these are all, I think, careful decisions that center directors, center leaders then need to make in light of resource constraints. That being said, I would certainly encourage the senior leaders in this room to think about ways that you can resource your centers to think about adequate staffing and adequate resourcing. Indeed. Indeed. You're, you're, by the way, your hockey references have made some people in the audience very happy. Uh, I, I, I think you've probably lit up the Canadian sector very, very <laughs> nicely with that. Um, the, uh, well, thank you. That's, that's, an, that's an excellent, thoughtful, and very nuanced answer to, to, my, um, to my basic question. Um, now, friends, I'm going to turn this over to you. I'm just the moderator here, and I'd, I'd love to hear your questions and, and your thoughts. And I can't even finish that sentence before a whole bunch of just popped up. So let me just start putting these up. And let's bring up one of the uh, Q&A questions. And this comes from uh, Julie Meyer. And uh, Julie asks, I'm wondering about the roles of educational developers and instructional designers in CTLs. How are the two roles evolving? And how are they merging and or diverging? That's a great question, Julie. And I'll start it. And then I imagine that there are other folks in this room who would like to chime in, chime in who maybe are instructional designers or wear both hats. Um, the first thing is I, I talked uh, about, in one of the responses to your prior question, Brian, about integrative emphases. And, and so the most common one that I saw in the book was about digital learning and online teaching. So I think it's becoming quite common that educational developers and instructional designers are, are working side by side mm -hmm. and, and, and accomplishing similar goals. Um, that, that has been my experience as well in that uh, in 2020, I had the great fortune of welcoming colleagues from digital learning design who then became a part of the Sheridan Center for Teaching and Learning. That's been a great asset to our work. I'll have to say, and to their credit, they are quite patient with me too, in that there's different language, uh, there's different types of work, there's different work cultures. So I think it certainly is a process uh, of talking through those in a respectful way to make sure that we're achieving common aims. You know, so just to give an example, they they talk a lot about projects and developing uh, programs and, and art. When we talk about programs, that's more like a course design institute or a learning community or a workshop. So, so thinking about common language, I think, uh, in, a, in a deep respect for the work as part of this project of integration. Oh, fascinating. That sounds, again, another uh, good angle for research. On, and uh, You know, uh, Brian, can I make one suggestion, actually? I absolutely. invited a, a special, well, I invited a few special guest stars from the book. Um, these are people that I want to highlight because I think they're really doing fantastic work. I think sometimes when outsiders talk about CTLs, often they talk about prominent centers or leading lights. And I don't think within educational development, we rank our work that way. We think about lots of good practice. And so I wanted one of my intentions for the book, and thank you to Greg Britton for publishing this book, <laughs> was, was to spotlight a range of good practice, especially from people or centers that might not get um, seen in Inside Higher Ed or Chronicle. And, and Carlos Guevara, I invited here. He he directs the work at CUNY Hostos. Oh wow! And he also directs the Digital Teaching and Learning Center too. And so I I think if he's here, I'd invite him to to raise his hand and chime in about that excellent question. Uh, I don't see Carlos right now, um, but um, I'll keep my eye out and uh, and okay. Uh, and see if he can uh, good. see if he can join us. Well, maybe someone else would like to tackle it, or we can move on to the next one. Well, I think you all know who you are. So, uh, if if you'd like to uh, if you'd like to be up on stage, uh, you know, please uh, just click the raised hand. Um, in fact, we do have several people who have hands raised, and uh, one of them I'd like to bring up is uh, Mary Talbot. Uh, let's see. 
Hello, Mary. Welcome. Hello, Brian. Um, long time, first time. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see you here. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mary, for bringing this up. And I am one of those that you described of uh, a center of one with two graduate or one graduate assistant and two student workers and faculty of 450. So I'm doing new faculty training, uh, which is now more orientation than it is training, new or faculty, uh, adjunct faculty. And a lot of the stuff I got because of POD, and POD gave me some great ideas of what to do. But how are some of these other centers trying to figure out where to spend your time? I do like every Friday, I have a lunch, kind of a lunch and learn thing. And sometimes I'll get 10 people. Sometimes I get five, sometimes I get 20. Um, we do a faculty development day at the beginning of every semester. And I have about 150 to 175 people who show up. And, and I'm trying to figure out all of these things take the same amount of work for what rate of return. And I'm not a big, you know, how, I could spend my time creating tickets for the work that I've done so that I have data to back up what I've done, but I feel like I'm doing everything twice. So walk me off the ledge and give me some ideas. Yes, please, please don't be on the ledge. It sounds like you're doing lots of great work and you're having good attendance. So that's a great signal, Mary. Um, I might offer three points of advice. Um, first, is, the first one is a question I always ask when doing a new program which is ask the person you report to, what would you like to see? <laughs> so what would you like to see out of the center to know that it's being successful or know that it's meeting your aims? Mm. So I think asking up can be a good way to know how to prioritize. Um, the second thing I would say, Mary, is there's a, a pretty robust literature on evidence around educational development programs. I'll, I'll in a minute put something in the chat but it suggests that um, to the extent that we can steer our work towards longer term programs, such as communities of practice, learning communities, um, as I mentioned, course design institutes, um, that those we would imagine that those will have more impact. It makes sense. Over a longer time, we could probably attribute more transformative change around teaching and learning. The third thing is something I want to underscore that I think you're already doing well. And so I want to highlight that is, is working with partners to do the work. So you mentioned faculty fellows. Um, I also saw that as a common trend in centers to help scale up the work. I think it also is a helpful and evidence-based practice to involve faculty as peers facilitating professional learning with their peers. Students as partners is another movement. Again, I think that scales up the work and also has benefits from fully integrating the student voice in what we do. And I think you can imagine other collaborations, which might be unusual suspects. Um, just this morning, I facilitated a faculty athletic coaches learning community. Mm. Coaches have been great partners for us in helping move towards the academic mission. And we talk about how to support student athletes, which are a significant proportion of our student population. So I think you might have some collaborators already that you're tapping into, but perhaps there are, are other organizational units that can be partners with you in achieving common aims. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. And the other part, which is always tough, is how do you get faculty buy-in, you know? We, we have, we use the Oscar rubric, we, we have trying to do some things, but getting the faculty to actually buy in and it's, I've been here a while, so I finally put my foot down on to one faculty member and I just said, your course is terrible and I'm never going to approve it the way it looks. <laughs> I said, I just can't stand this any longer. It's taken me forever and I hate your course. And not only do I hate it, but other faculty members hate it because their children have said how bad it is. I've never said Whoa. anything like that before. Wow. <laughs> wow. I've, I've had faculty come to me because their children were so upset about your course. And he's mm -hmm. like, well, why didn't they come to me? And I said, really, you're asking that question. So uh, it's it's gotten better and I've gotten buy-in by some and I've just kind of had to put my foot down and you have to be careful when you do that, when you stop somebody that you don't keep, you know, I say you can back somebody in a corner, but you got to give them a way out. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think you do have to be careful with conversations like that. 
sometimes we do have to have those tough love conversations, but my hope is rarely. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. pretty rare. And my hope is more towards steering what you're describing as faculty buy-in and engagement. And I think some of that is working with faculty fellows and doing the work. I think it's doing careful needs assessment. So we're making sure that our programs and services align with what faculty want. And I think it's through governance structures like I talk about in the book, like faculty advisory boards, or we also have a faculty liaisons group who can give us really good information uh, on what they would see as helpful. So some of those are some of the strategies that I found useful in my practice, Mary, and also I talk about in the book as other centers using. Yeah. I've taken enough time. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you've been terrific. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. And and you've made my you've made my day with that story. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Um, well, listen, um, if we can, I think, build on that point because several questions have come together along this specific point of of partnering with different entities on, on campus. Uh, just to set that up very quickly in, in the chat, uh, our mutual friend, uh, Stephen Volk, uh, says that he brought in athletics and coaches at Oberlin with great success. Mm -hmm. A considerable amount of time with students and their approach to teaching and learning always contains important insights. Um, I wanted to share that. Uh, William Duffy had a different angle. He said, I, I always wonder if it's faculty buy-in versus faculty ability to integrate changes. We have some faculty teaching 10 classes a semester at my school, uh, which limits their ability to uh, you know, change what they're doing. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to put those out there. But we have a we have a few questions uh, that um, that work along these lines. Um, and uh, here's one from um, uh, our good friend, uh, Ed Finn at Valparaiso. Uh, and he says, as a small center of four people, we tend to gravitate towards collaborating with different standing committees working groups and cross-functional teams. Does that fit with your approach? Um, I might ask Ed to clarify more to make sure I'm fully understanding the question. Sure. I'll but but I do think it aligns with, with the partnership and collaborative approach I was outlining before. I suspect we're on the same wavelength there. Okay, and Ed, if you, if you'd like to say more about that, either you know, click the raised hand, uh, or if you can't do video right now, uh, just you know, add another uh, Q and A question, and, and and I can bring that up. Um, well, while we're thinking about that, uh, here's another partnering question, and this is from Greg Siri. Oh, hang on, hang on. Uh, we do have that. So let's bring him on stage. I love that. Hello, Ed. Thank you, Ed, for clarifying your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Very well. Okay, just wanted to make sure. No, thank you. And it, this is a great conversation. So I, I did want to clarify because uh, we we use standing committees. So we have a committee on to enhance teaching and learning. That's one committee. We also have an advisory group made up of faculty from across campus. And then we also have a staff group that support faculty that advise us as well to kind of see the landscape of what faculty are dealing with as much as we can. Uh, and we have two designers in our in our group, uh, and then I kind of wear both hats, and then we have a faculty development person. So we, we kind of try and do a lot of things, but we're housed in the provost's office. And I just wanted to see if this kind of meshed. It sounded like it did, but I, I wanted to get your take on it. It sounds excellent, Ed. And I also have to comment, I love your book wheel behind you, too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> It, it, my my father in law actually made it. It's a reproduction of uh, Thomas Jefferson's mm, yeah. involving book stand. So yeah. thank you. It's <laughs> a great thing. Well, thank you, Ed. Thank you for clarifying. And um, and um, and Mary, again, thank you for your answers. Uh, let's let's continue along this line because we have a uh, a couple of questions that build along that. And here's one from a, a different direction. Uh, this is Greg Searing, I believe. Um, and uh, Greg asks about different populations. Can you share how you handle discussions with faculty or administrators, chairs, associate deans, et cetera, who ask for services or programs that don't align with center priorities and capacity? Thanks for the question, Greg, and, and good to see you here. Um, well, I imagine others have great advice on this too. I don't have a research-based approach, but a, a practice-based approach mm. is a no and. <laughs> No, sorry, I can't do what you asked for. And I could do something else, maybe smaller scale, maybe the next term or the next year, 
or in a different way than you've articulated. So I, I still try to be helpful, even if I'm not able to accommodate the original request as framed. Well, that's that's a really good answer. And I'm sure that's a, a topic that a lot of you have run into. Uh, and again, if you want to add more either in the chat or if you want to click raised hand to join us on stage to talk about it, or if you'd like to just you know, enter a Q&A box question, um, we have another question that, that follows along those lines. Um, and uh, this comes from uh, Jenna Linskins, I believe. Uh, and Jenna asks this, are there any models like TPAC, Technology, Pedagogy, and Content Knowledge, or others that bring the Center for Faculty of Teaching together with instructional technology team to support faculty? Um, I, I certainly think there are models um, that we found helpful to be a common discussion. Um, I think the community of inquiry model is one that I think has been especially helpful here. Uh, during the pandemic, like many centers, um, we had to work at scale to partner with faculty to redesign their courses. And um, the way that we did this was through a large scale course design institute that we called Anchor. We are located in the ocean state and so liberally use uh, yeah. <laughs> metaphors, but it also, of course, we wanted faculty to feel a sense of anchoring and that they were gonna be okay. Um, but the community of inquiry model was one that really anchored the Anchor Institute in terms of helping um, bring together educational developers and learning designers and supporting faculty. Very good. And just let me just quickly on a meta level say, um, friends, I can tell you're not shy about asking questions, uh, which is excellent. So please keep them coming. And, and Mary, you're being just fantastic at answering. This is a, a great guru moment, I think, uh, being able to connect you with all of your research and all of your practice to all these different points. Yeah. And if there's a lull, I have to say, Brian, there's you know a couple of people I might want to, again, who are special guest stars in the book, and I could bring them up to spotlight their work, too. Absolutely. I, I don't see a lull happening, but I'd be glad to, you know, to break in and, and, and bring them up. Um, and one, uh, one question for everyone, the, the chat right now is so rich. There's so much going on. Let me just ask everyone who is using the chat, would you mind if I saved it and then posted it, lightly edited as a blog post? Mm -hmm. um, so by lightly edited, I mean I, I remove everybody's name um, and I, I do a little bit of arranging in you know, an outline and, you know, uh, in order to make it uh, flow to someone who hasn't been here. Just let me know in the chat if, if you object. Um, we have a, another question for another partnership angle, which is one of my favorite partnerships to, to bring up. Uh, and this comes from Catherine Furlong of Bucknell. Um, centers for all things are proliferating across campuses. What does it mean for mature services that align with teaching and learning like libraries? Um, Catherine, I wonder if you might want to come up and elaborate and give us more context too. I'd love to hear, I love it when people articulate their questions. Uh, me too, me too. Um, the, uh, and if you, uh, if, if you don't have uh, access to a uh, video, if you're not in a good place for that and so on, please just, uh, uh, either type in the chat or just, um, give us a, uh, uh, a line of Q and a box, um, questions so that I can, uh, I, no. I guess if not, I can start on this while Catherine, um, may come on video. I, 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 I'm hearing in the question maybe there, the concern that there's too much centering. And um, I might think about it a different way in that um, Debbie Lowy, who is an educational developer at St. Louis University and Deandra Little, who is an educational developer, now Dean of the Faculty at Elon, and I wrote an article in Change Magazine in 2018. And, and one of the things we did in the, that article was mark the 25th anniversary of a really seminal article by Barr and Tag mm -hmm. that discussed moving from an instruction-centered to a learning-centered paradigm. Um, but we all, what we also noted is that we thought, actually, there was another move going on um, to a decentered educational paradigm. And we thought this because of some work by Randy Bass talking about the pressures from the experiential co-curriculum, the pressures from informal learning. And I think now actually we're seeing it with generative AI as well as seeing that as a very decentering type of technology. And so in light of the, that what we called a decentered educational paradigm, 
we said, well, well, what's the need then for a center for teaching and learning? If things are decentered, why do we need a center? Mm -hmm. And and we we argued that um, we need centers to again in that active sense of the verb to to recenter or connect distributed environments across campus across the learning landscape. And so I, I think these these centering functions um, are not a bad idea because I do think they help, especially with instructors who then are needing to forage across many different locations on campus and outside of campus then to develop effective learning environments. So, so it may be, I'd love to hear more context about why you're feeling it's a challenge, but I, I think this might be actually be an interesting trend. To <laughs> oh, who you better are. to pick that up than Catherine Furlong? Hello, Catherine. Was I supposed to do something to get here? <laughs> you, you did exactly the right thing. Ah, there you go. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, my voice, it's allergy season. I'm coming oh. from central Pennsylvania and farmland and pollen are... Oh, Me too, Catherine. I am <laughs> feeling it now. You both sound good. You both uh, sound good. Well, thank you. Um, it's more that... I. The, when I arrived at Bucknell five years ago, which was, you know, right before that pandemic, it was a perfect opportunity for me in my role within our merged library and IT organization to partner with the Teaching and Learning Center. And we did a great job of coming together to support folk and have continued to work together so very, very, very well. But on telling stories out of, out of turn, but, on my campus, we are having centers for data, centers for innovation and entrepreneurship, centers for public policy, centers for all these wonderful, wonderful, dynamic, changing, life impacting things. But at the same time, it divides the attention in ways that I would love my vision would be for the library to become the center of centers and bring everything and everyone together so that we could become this sort of collision center in a good way, not in an auto repair way, in a collision of ideas and people coming together to create new knowledge. And instead, I unfortunately fear, and it's fear, that we're moving towards just more different kinds of silos and the silos mm. that down during the pandemic are being built in different ways. Does that make sense? It does. And, and I, I think it, you could be right. And it's good that you're mindful of that. Um, but what I hear is a suggestion is that there might be an opportunity to play what I might call a hub strategy, a hub theory of change, and for you to be a convener or a hearth, an intellectual hearth, then to bring together these distributed efforts uh, in some common aim. I think a low level way that I like to do this is to, I call it a collaborative lunch. And so my senior leadership team, we, we say, what's another unit where we want to really be working more in collaboration with them, but, but something's, we're missing something here. Mm -hmm. Clearly the question's about us, so we're not, ask, we're not answering and vice versa. And so we invite people to lunch and we thank them for their work. That's the key objective. But it's a great opportunity to go around the table and ask questions and then deepen partnerships starting with those individual re relationships. So I wonder in your case, are there any collaborative lunch opportunities um, to start? Lunch is hard at Bucknell because we don't have common hours uh, over lunch, but I am doing in October a coffee and donuts with library and IT kind of oh, thing. Lovely. Before classes start, it means I have to get up and get here early in the morning, which is not so lovely, but otherwise it's a great opportunity to focus in this case on literacies. So we have invited the new director for its brand new Center for Data Science to come and talk about data literacy for one of those sessions with, with one of my partners here in LMIT. And I'm doing one with um, <clears throat> one of our associate provosts on deep reading and mm. literacies. And it's going to be a fun series of programs. So yes, we're doing that. And I appreciate your um, support for those sorts of ideas and and helping me realize we are going in the right direction sometimes it sounds exciting and i think donuts sometimes have a magical impact so good for you for coming up with that approach important theory of change uh, food is uh, is crucial for us if, if i can actually 
uh, Catherine, if I can keep you on stage for, for a minute longer, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if uh, Mary and, and also Catherine, if you want to press on the library role a bit more. Uh, in the chat, a few people have mentioned that their teaching and learning center moved into library. Um, is there anything everyone else should know about partnering or connecting libraries with teaching and learning centers? And I, I'm saying this in part because the, the Future Transform is a long-term library um, uh, place. We love libraries and we're constantly talking about libraries. It, it is a very common collaborative space, and I mean space physically. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, I am located in the Sciences okay. Library. Okay. These used to be books that were cleared out, and now uh, the Center for Teaching and Learning occupies three and a half floors of the library. Um, it's also a common point of co a collaboration around things like data literacy, uh, generative AI. It's a common partnership now as well. Um, we work a lot with our libraries in terms of supporting the Canvas learning management system and course reserves. Um, we've also worked in terms of um, opening up their their public goods, their resources to help bring in classes so that the students can engage, for example, with archives and gain from the, that kind of richness. So I think there's a, a ton of collaborative opportunities with libraries. And um, collaborative opportunities and shared expertise in so many ways. Mm. The librarians and information technologists that work within my organization complement the work that's being done in so many wonderful ways by our writing center and the Center for Teaching and Learning and all the other organizations that support, directly support student and faculty teaching and learning. You're right. And I think to underscore that point, if memory serves correctly, in the most recent to improve the academy, TIA is the journal of the pod network, mm -hmm. there was a library, I'm sorry, there was an article about librarians as educational developers talking about your point exactly. And I think that was in the most recent issue. Maybe someone can put that in the chat. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, someone... Thank you for that tip, I haven't seen it. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. You know, I'm always here for you, Brian. Well, please, please say hi to everybody for me at uh, Bucknell and take care. More donuts. Um, and we are uh, in the chat, a bunch of people added more about their library work, including uh, University of Pennsylvania. Um, now, you mentioned, Mary, some of the other magic words, uh, which was generative AI. So naturally, naturally, we have a, a question uh, along those lines. Um, and, uh, oh, we actually just lost. No, no, we do have Brent. Uh, so let me see if I can bring him up on stage. Uh, this is um, our, our excellent friend from the American University of Armenia where it is ridiculously late at night, but Brent is always, always full of energy, enthusiasm, and a great deal of knowledge um, about generative AI. Brent, welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. So yeah, I actually used to be a director for a Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, but it was housed within the Office of Institutional Research and Assessment, right? So mm -hmm. it was kind of brought in there, and it was one of those things where uh, I, like I struggled to get it to be pushed up because it wasn't an actual uh, created thing. It was just sort of a tacked on thing, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of is an important question. I really want to ask you about the effects of, of generative AI on the centers of teaching and learning. That's my main question. But I also wanted to pose something to you as far as talking about the importance of ensuring that leadership is part of this whole aspect of centers for teaching and learning because in my experience you won't get far at all if you don't have leadership that's pushing for it if you don't have leadership that's bringing it up at meetings that's showing up periodically and the biggest thing that i found because uh it, there was this culture of oh it's not that important and if it's if there's that culture there then that culture has to change so all these other mechanisms have to be in place, like leadership importance, like tying it in with faculty evaluation, right? What have you done for professional development this year? That's part of your evaluation. And the Center for Teaching and Learning can be a major part of that. It doesn't have to be the only part, but if it's not at least part of the conversation, I don't see how a CTL will really succeed if that culture isn't already there. So that's my overall question for, for your thoughts on that, as well as, what about uh, uh, overall AI and how that's affecting things with uh, Centers for Teaching and Learning? Yeah, these are great questions. And, and I think if, I, if it's okay if I decouple your questions, Brett. Sure, yeah. Um, maybe I'll tie them together with a thread at the end, but but I do see them as both 
equally important but distinct. So first, generative AI. Um, so the book was written before generative mm -hmm. AI came onto the education de development landscape in broad form. I'm, I'm certain there are people who were using it individually, but not in a large scale. Right. Um, and so, so I wasn't able to map that. But one of the things I did do is I worked with a Brown junior, Emma Jane Rodenheiser. She is now since graduated and a medical school student in New York. Um, but she, I worked with Emma Jane to code over 5,000 titles of programs. And, and by programs, I mean workshops, certificates, or courses. And we found 32 topics, so that's quite a lot, indicating the spread and depth of Center's work. But, but the number one topic was, was digital teaching and learning. And so that mm -hmm. suggests to me that certainly the, if you map forward, this would be probably the number one topic for Center's today. Another reason that I think it's going to—it's hugely on center's radar screen—is again I mentioned uh, when Brian asked me about my work this year, in terms of our surveys of U.S. educational developers, um, when we asked them about issues that where we thought the field would go in the next five years, two topics came up. Um, one was diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. The second was emerging technologies, and emerging technologies I think was the number one issue for those at associates and community colleges. So, so again, I think centers are going to play a key role in working on their campuses and helping navigate the generative AI landscape. And I think this is a, a wicked problem or a wicked opportunity and centers mm -hmm. are well positioned to do that because we work with students, faculty and staff, many constituencies and at many levels from the individual to the organizational unit. Your second question then was thinking about how the importance of having leadership at the table. And it sounded to me like you were mentioning some strategies that I think are particularly important. <laughs> and so in some ways, I think maybe you have answered your question, but aligning the center's work with the institutional mission. So, so to be valued, we have to do something of value. And so one key way is aligning our work with institutional mission or even in an individual level. And as I said in my response to a previous question, asking the person you report to, what, what would you like to see the center do or to know that we've been successful? Um, but, but senior leaders, I think it's also important for them to support their centers. And some of it is through resources and staffing. I know that's particularly tricky these days. But I think a no cost way that leaders need to be supportive of centers and help them do their work most effectively is give centers opportunities for visibility and influence. So if a president or provost mentions the center's work in their talk, the literature on faculty motivation suggests that despite maybe what faculty think, they will be more likely to engage with the center about that because yeah. they see the institutional signaling that's important to senior leadership. It's also important for senior leadership to consider what tables the center should be at. You know, so I've heard stories at other campuses, for example, that there might be a committee on grading, but the center director was not invited to participate in that committee. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so I think it works both ways. I think we can very much support the ambitions of senior leaders, but I hope senior leaders then can support the ambitions of centers. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's that's uh, that's what I've seen because it's this aspect of culture, right? Because if you want people to show up for professional development and there's no incentive besides the, the idea of, oh yeah, I need to develop myself. If you, if that, I mean, that's the best thing, right? But if you don't have that culture of everyone wanting that, then you're gonna have low people turn out and it just won't move forward. Hmm. So having this aspect of, all those other components I think is going to be extremely important in order to, to be able to properly move forward. So I like that idea of being at the table and being, getting those mentions and yeah, cause I mean, that, that's, that's the biggest issue is you, just like what the, the first speaker talked about, you put all this effort to having an event, to bringing people in and five people show up and the five people that show up are the five people that always show up. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why is that? That's because, leadership didn't push it, the deans didn't push it to their people, 
Why? Because the provost or the president doesn't hold anybody accountable or doesn't think that it's important unless it gets explicitly expressed. I think there's a lot of thinking that, oh yeah, that's implied. We're an educational institution. Well, you would think that since we all talk about lifelong learning, that all instructors would have built in lifelong learning and want to do this, but man, that really needs to be explicit. So I appreciate your answer. Absolutely. And I just wanted to follow up on one thing you said, because I, I certainly understand what you're saying in terms of we put on an event and sometimes five people show up. But but I do want to kind of put a pin on that because it is a common stereotype of the work of Centers for Teaching and Learning that we just preach to the choir. Mm. And uh, one of the things I documented in my book is actually we, we have a broad reach. If you look both at surveys, and I did an analysis of over 100 annual reports um, in any given year. So this is just one year, not the cycle of a faculty career. We're reaching a majority of faculty and a significant proportion of graduate students and about a quarter of undergraduates, even though many centers don't directly work with undergraduates. And, and, and so I, I want to underscore that even though we might individually have challenges <laughs> with any given event, on aggregate, we, we do have broad impact in that way. Nice. Great. Thank you. Appreciate your time. As usual, Brent, thank you so much. And uh, everyone should know Brent is, uh, you know, for me, the great world uh, leader in thinking about AI uh, literacy and higher education. Uh, we have time for one last question, uh, Mary. And I'm actually going to smush two questions together because they're they're on, on the same topic or on the same wavelength. One is from Jenna Linskins. Uh, and she asks this, so let me put this up on the stage first. What are some tips for selling a vision or idea on establishing a TCL to the different partners, library, center for faculty, IT, et cetera, and the college leadership? So how do you sell a vision or idea for establishing a TCL? And then right on top of that, we have a question here from Chad Fulton, which is, what communication strategy, in addition to impact reports and scholarship, do you think build momentum and tell the story of this work? branding, case studies, multimedia, et cetera. You see that they're, they're very similar um, uh, questions. So I guess the communication and the uh, persuasion uh, theme. And influence, yes. Yes. Yeah, um, again, I, let me mention, I, I invited a couple of folks who have done this work at other campuses and just to broaden the perspective for different institutional types. I see Leslie Ortquist Aarons here, who's done the work for a long time at Berea and I highlighted the Berea CTL for its incubator approach as that particular strategic orientation I thought was really strong. And I wonder if Leslie might um, showcase her work in terms of how how she influences the campus and grew the CTL there. Actually, was this Leslie uh, Cranbrill or Leslie Orquist? Leslie Orquist. Very good. Here, let me bring Leslie up, which may come as a shock. So Leslie, hello. Hello, everyone. Good to see everyone. And thank you, Mary, for your really amazing work and your graciousness. Yeah, um, I joined Berea in 2012, and there was a long history there of a learning center and a writing center. And you, you, you made one comment that was I had to write down. It was um, about when you when you are unintentionally putting a lot of things together, you had a term for that that made me laugh because it was that it was putting everything there was a career development center there was academic coaching mm. we're a college of 1500 students um and so i had come from a place where i was using what you call mary a hub approach really trying to bring people together and do things really really centrally and affect change that way and it became clear to have some kind of a central mission for this group of us um, we needed to focus on a, an approach that was much more kind of individual centered and growth centered. Um, and so that became our what, what held us together. We have a notion of um, it's a place where faculty are learners and students are also teachers. So, so those are some of the things that I think um, came out in our conversations. Thank you, Mary. That's great. And then I wonder if um, Girija Nagoswami is here from Community College of Philadelphia, because that um, exemplifies a hub approach to growing the work. And I think their tagline was even that they're the hub of professional learning. So if Garish is here, I wonder if she might speak to that. The, the, the problem is we are out of time. Oh, okay. We're, we're, we're past the end of the hour. Uh, yep. I, I would that. love to hear more and I'm glad to get her name on, 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 on the record. 
Uh, and Leslie, I'm glad you could join us. On Thanks, today. Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. Um, those are those are great questions. Um, and and Mary, these are fantastic answers. It's just been terrific spending an hour with you exploring teaching and learning centers. You have so, so much experience, so much reflection, so much analysis and so much networking with so many people. It's, it's just astonishing. I, I, I wanted to thank you and then ask you a question. How can we keep up with you? What, what, what are the best ways to follow your work and, and learn from you? So I would say I put this in the chat. Um, the key way now is I'm active on LinkedIn. Very good. So that's Mary C. Hyphen Wright, and um, look forward to connecting with people there. Well, you're probably going to get a whole bunch of ping, ping, pings of on, on LinkedIn over the next few minutes. I'm, I'm sure. Um, Mary, thank you so much. This is terrific work. Uh, please keep up with it, and I'm really looking forward to uh, where you where this goes next, and to bring you back so we can keep up with you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Take care. Now, don't leave everybody else, though, just to uh, wrap things up to say thank you all for the great questions. Uh, we have some we didn't get to. I'm going to try and put those into the record. If you'd like to keep talking about this on social media, you can find us all across uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, and Blue Sky. Uh, if you would like to look into our previous sessions, talking about teaching and learning as well as ways of improving teaching and learning and institutional collaboration, you can look at our archive, tinyurl.com slash archive. Uh, looking ahead, we have sessions coming up on enrollment, reforming grading, and future workforce. But just a heads up, we don't have a session next week because I will be in Mexico giving a speech at exactly the same time. We'll resume the next time. I'm going to try to do an extra session to make up for it. Uh, again, thank you all for being with us and putting your minds together. It's wonderful to have this kind of collaborative space. Thank you all uh, as well for your hard work. I hope everybody's safe and sound in this autumn, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere. Please take care and be well. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.